One question I often get asked is why? Why do I make my videos about online deviants out of everything? Well, a big part of it and a big part of why so many others do similar content isn't just because it's entertainment, but also because these videos are often devices for awareness and justice. In fact, they've almost become a necessity due to the current consequences of being an online predator and a large content creator. The power that comes from such a position is immense, and exploiting that position for predatory means upon young fans who totally adore and idolise them is a scary prospect. It also doesn't exactly help the platforms such as YouTube seem to act very sporadically with these situations, punishing these kinds of videos with age restrictions whilst taking years to deliver real punishment upon those who deserve it. In fairness, most of the time these situations don't have the involvement of the legal system, so YouTube can't exactly be sure, except this case that we're covering today did have exactly that, and yet the person's channel is still up. In 2016, a pretty relevant figure in an era looked on today with nostalgia suddenly disappeared for weeks on end, and as the internet dug deeper and deeper, the true disgusting story of what this individual had been doing was revealed. Explicit and immeasurably horrifying actions that had got a Minecraft YouTuber on the radar of the FBI. So what really happened to Jinbop? Before we talk about what Jinbop did, we first need to start with the man himself, Starlet Zhao, born November 18th, 1992 in the state of Washington, USA, to parents of Chinese descent. Early information about him testifies that Jinbop lived in Washington for all his life, and during third grade, was good friends with another kid called Adam. We'll get back to that later. During school, Jin took up a particular interest in drama. His original dream was singing, but after giving up on that due to his technical abilities, he instead decided to pick up acting in college, noting that he had a passion to entertain. But acting wasn't where his heart really was, and he began to discover other outlets as a way to fulfil that passion. The first ever account of Jinbop Online was actually through a different name and on a different website that being DeviantArt. The account WaffleZ42 was made in around 2011, and features the earliest pictures of Jimbop online that we've ever seen, as well as his drawings. His bio reads as follows. Favourite genre of music? Trance, C-pop, K-pop. MP3 player of choice? Wish I had one. Someone wanna buy me an iPod? Favourite cartoon character? Jew. Personal quote. Life is a bitch. My bitch. It's kind of surreal to see this, a traversing through an internet graveyard of sorts, but one where Jinbop also reveals the origins of his name, that being borrowed from the character Jin Kisaragi from the video game series Blazblue. But from the post history, it seems as if he quickly got bored of this and moved on from it. So he finally made a YouTube channel and started uploading vlogs. Initially, Jin didn't have a firm grasp and knowledge of YouTube, which at the time was a relatively new societal aspect. He understood how to use it, but wasn't really in touch with the community inside. So much so that he actually recalled meeting Markiplier in a bar and talking to him without having any idea who he was. I've told this story a couple of times before, and I'll tell it again just because it is relevant. Um, I met Markiplier once at a Christmas party, I think around in 2013, around the time I started up my channel. But by then, I wasn't posting videos. I didn't post videos for another half year after. And the awkward thing is I didn't know who he was. I just sort of sat there and I talked with him and I was like, uh -huh, yeah, cool, dude, that's awesome, cool. But in reality, I didn't know anything about gaming YouTube back then. So this whole world just sort of opened up to me the moment I started uploading videos. Like, I had no idea there was this side of YouTube. I mean, I'd heard of PewDiePie, but who hadn't at that point? But then, you know, I started seeing communities. I started, you know, seeing these panels. I started seeing these events. And that's when it all became a little bit more real for me. And I was like, all right, yeah, this is amazing. And this is something that I really want to be a part of. By the end of 2013, Jin had abandoned his short-lived vlogging channel as he felt it wasn't really for him. And he began to drift away from YouTube entirely. But it was during this time that he reconnected with some of his oldest friend, including that old third grade friend called Adam that we mentioned. Full name, Adam Dahlberg, or as he's more well known, Sky Does Minecraft. A game called Cops and Robbers, and I am where where Sky Does Minecraft, or he's all by himself, look at him. Ow! I will hit you again, I will I'm kill sorry, you again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm here with Agent Canadian, who's by himself as well. Yes, Jinbop's childhood friend was one of the fastest growing YouTubers on the platform, 
and just a year away from creating one of the most popular YouTube groups of his time, that being Team Crafted. Sky's success had really interested Jinbop, and according to him, had opened his eye to the gaming scene on YouTube, inspiring him to make content again, this time with an entirely new and flourishing community. Either that, or he just wanted money. But on December 13th, 2013, Jinbop took the leap and created his channel under the name Jinbop Gaming. And the first video that's public to watch is Minecraft Beginnings, uploaded on July the 13th, 2014. For all its faults to see later, it has to be said that Jinbop was a relatively hardworking creator. He uploaded a lot of videos during 2014, an average of around 5 to 6 videos a week. But in a landscape of Let's Plays, this was relatively drowned out. And whilst Jinbot was growing steadily, his channel wasn't anything that stood out. His personality was really just a clone of what was popular at the time, even addressing that aspect in his first video. Hey, what's poppin'? My name is Jinbob. Welcome to the channel. To get things started, I have for you today a Let's Play. More specifically, a Let's Play of Minecraft. I know. Original, right? Shocking. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time staring at the menu, so let's just get right into it. Over the next year, Jinbop would play a variety of games, from CSGO, to Payday 2, to GTA 5. And although this did grow his channel decently, that seemed to really be his peak. If Jinbop's career continued this way for the rest of his life, then it's likely that he would have just been a forgotten footnote in history. However, a Hail Mary had descended. Due to internal fighting with Team Crafted, Sky, who had mostly been a distant friend due to his workload, had slowly started drifting away from the team during late 2014, and was looking to make plans for his own group of Minecraft YouTubers who he could be closer with. This was later to be Sky Media, and Sky had already begun looking for creators to join, one of which was Jinbop. In September 2014, the two collaborated on videos and continued to work more closely over time, as thanks to the prospect of collaborating with one of the biggest YouTubers at the time, Jinbop's sub count sprung up to 10k in October 2014, and he suddenly became a lot more well known. Hey, what's poppin' Jinbop here? Jim Jinbop! <laughs> Coming to you guys today with something a little unique and a little wacky. 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 Today I got Mount Your Friends. And of course you need friends to play this game. So I brought along a friend of mine. Scott is Minecraft or Adam. You can call me Jim Bob Gaming. But it's also important to note here that his popularity stemmed mostly from Sky, which makes a big difference here. Not only would that aspect cause divisions later on, but it also offered a possible explanation for why so many people forgot about him entirely. As for now though, the two had some big plans brewing, and in early 2015, Sky Media was officially established as a new outlet for content creation. Jinbop moved into the house along with Sky and many other fellow members, including Yorpa Ross and that guy Barney. And it was during this time that Jinbop produced some of his most iconic and well-received content in the Minecraft videos he participated in for the next few months. Though most of them are now gone off Sky's channel, some have survived through re-uploads. However, even at this stage, some shady stuff was still going on. Tim.TV, one of the editors of the Sky Media House, recently recollected a foreshadowing experience he had at the Sky Media office when he last saw Jinbop during 2015. Jin used to be at the office as late as me, and I was always wondering what he was up to. I checked and he was talking to fans on Skype, which I thought was pretty weird because they were literal kids. I brought this up to management and was told to mind my own business and edit. I remember fans openly talking about being in Skype calls with Jin on the TeamSpeak until late and watching anime together and shit. I didn't think it was weird. I just thought it was cool. I was 15 then. Biggest fucking regret of my life that I didn't speak up about it then. Point in case, it was very strange how close Jinbot was to his fans. Of course, fan interaction is everything, and nowadays you kind of expect creators to be active with their fans. But back during 2015, this was weird. I mean, even now, the idea of an adult content creator staying on these long night calls with his fan base of tweens is incredibly dodgy. But management, and likely Sky himself, ignored complaints, probably because Sky wanted a control around his team of creators that was stronger than Team Crafted. But even that wasn't achievable. One of the establishing things that Sky did for more control around Sky Media's members was through direct ownership of their channels, and this fate particularly befell your pal Ross, as Sky purchased his childhood channel and transformed it into the business-oriented Couch Potatoes, colliding with many other business decisions related to Sky Media and another argument within the newly created Vision Squad, this had persuaded Ross and two editors to move out the house. But more importantly to this story, this also persuaded Jinbop to leave Sky Media in early 2016. Although not for the exact same reasons. As heard on Twitch streams of his, Jinbop didn't really want to do his whole career in the shadow of Sky, and wanted to build a viewer base for himself. Or to directly quote the man, I was tired of being that guy who recorded the videos of Sky does Minecraft. Jinbop also officially cited personal issues as his reason to leave, 
with those issues ranging from the drama with your pal Ross, or the fact that Jinbop had allegedly broken up with his alleged girlfriend Becky Bake. The latter is only a rumour though, I don't want to send some poor girl misinformation and harassment, it's only a rumour. Now I don't particularly like talking about personal issues, so I'll just say that there's been a lot of them. There's a bunch of stuff that I need to sort out first. Now, I'm not trying to say that you guys aren't important to me or that I've forgotten about you because that's not the case. You guys are important to me. You guys all matter. It's just that lately I've been struggling with a lot and it's probably fair to say that I'm actually at the lowest point I've ever been in my life. But you know, like, that's all fine. Struggling is okay. We all come to that point where we just feel so helpless and lost that we have a hard time justifying it all, and that's just sort of where I am right now. And with that, Jinbop moved back to his home in Bellevue and continued his content production on his own, leaving with decent terms with Sky, although falling out of touch with him, and continuing on the same path he'd been going on. From then on, Jinbop never appeared in any of Sky's videos ever again, and the reality of the situation was that many of those 300,000 subscribers that Jinbop had now gained was just growing dead weight. Jimbot realised he wasn't exactly self-made and essentially wheeled off the back of the most influential gaming YouTuber at the time. After all, why is it that when you search for Jimbot's most viewed video, the most viewed of them is a video with 500,000 views on a channel with 300,000 subscribers? Jinbop really didn't have any personality. His videos could be cropped out with any other person with only an appeal to those who were fans of Sky. And throughout 2016, he worked hard to wipe that idea clean and reform his channel. But his channel was dying without Sky's promotion. He had been too over reliant as he tried to regain his audience, working day in, day out, trying to stop the rot. This work continued from his hiatus to a sudden end in August, when, after consistent uploads for months, he suddenly disappeared, and in the coming months, the friendly and bubbly exterior of Jinbop would be peeled back. And instead, what we were given is a truly sick individual. Hey, what's popping? Jin Bob here. Can I stay with V is Calling? This was actually recommended to me by my good friend Ethan, also known as Crank Gameplays. He said it's a, sort of a game that's about dating through the. Uh, it's getting into a call with this girl. So, um, that brings back some memories for me because the first love that I ever had was sort of over the internet. From here on out, everything in this segment is sourced from the criminal complaint that was sent to the Eastern Michigan District Court by the FBI. This document can be found publicly via a Kotaku article and also via Scribd. Around the summer of 2015, Jim Bob got in contact with a girl, who has been kept anonymous for this video. For reference, at the time of them getting in contact, the girl was 14, Jim Bob was 23. Originally, this girl was a fan of Jim Bob and had been providing with assistance on videos with the Sky House, as well as his own channel, in particular producing art for him. Her links for socials were even found in some of Sky's videos. Jim Bob and this girl were frequently chatting over Skype, but their friendship soon turned to a relationship, foreshadowed by a tweet from a witness. I was in a Skype call with him and one of the victims he was convicted of grooming. It's truly baffling to me now. I just sat there as they flirted and he played his guitar for us. Looking back, I wondered why no one ever stopped him from doing that. Around February 2016, the girl's parents noticed that she began to exhibit types of behaviour she normally wouldn't do, such as asking her parents to buy clothes that showed off her parts of her body more. Furthermore, her parents noticed that she wasn't even wearing the clothing outside the house, but instead it lay on the floor of her bedroom near her computer desk. And most concerningly, the girl began wearing a locket around her neck, with a picture of Jinbop inside. With all of this considered, the girl's parents became incredibly concerned for her, and their fears were confirmed when they secretly recorded a call between her and Jinbop. In this call, you could hear Jinbop telling his victim to strip her clothes off, and giving advice to the girl on grooming her Jinbop also acknowledges the girl's age, which just as a reminder, is 14. Fast forward to March, when on a call with the girl, Jimbop discusses the possibility of her convincing her parents to take a family vacation to Florida so they can meet up. This was around the time that the girl's parents notified the FBI of their concerns, and from here on out, a lot becomes clearer. On May the 20th, 2016, a 37 minute video call on Skype between the girl and Jimbop was recorded by the FBI. In the call, a number of things happen. Jimbop has abandoned his plan for meeting up in Florida and discusses trying to convince the girl's parents to let her travel from her home in Michigan to Seattle, near Jimbop's home in Bellevue. Jimbop had also offered to rent her a hotel room if she travelled. The two also talk about how the minimum age to work in Washington is 16 years old, and the girl is only 14 right now, discussing how they would handle their future relationship. However, out of everything, Jimbop's detailed sexual conversations with a 14-year-old 
are unsurprisingly the worst of the call. Jimbop and the girl talk about her performing oral sex on Jimbop. She says that she's never done this and asks Jimbop how to do it, and he gives an explanation. Jimbop also asks later in the call if he will be her first, referring to her first sexual partner, and then asks her if he can kiss her in between her legs. Jimbop then says, You should take off some clothes for me. I was buying your underwear. Can I give it a kiss? And the girl obliges to his request, exposing herself to Jinbop on camera. Disgusting stuff, I know, but uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Importantly, with this call, the FBI were able to easily determine that Jinbop had committed a crime, the solicitation of CP, and they were ready to now begin tracking him. As FBI agents monitor the many calls between Jinbop and the girl from May to June, the others sought to find out his details. On June 26th, Jinbop's IP address was identified, and finding out it was connected to Comcast, the FBI submitted an administrative subpoena, or for more simpler definitions, a request for information to the company. Four days later, Comcast obliged and gave him everything, which included Jimbop's name, address, telephone and email. They also cross-referenced the man seen the call with that of national crime databases and confirmed that this was their man. They had found him. On July the 1st, 2016, Jimbop and the girl once again discussed the prospect of them meeting up, and since she wasn't allowed to travel to Washington, Jimbop suggested that he could travel to Michigan to meet the girl. And just like clockwork, 20 days later, he booked a flight from Seattle, Washington to Detroit, Michigan. On July the 25th, 2016, during a call between Jimbop and the girl, Jimbop says, You're going to give your first blowjob in a little over a week now. Think you're going to be much better at it? During the same call, the girl also asks Jimbop if he is in love with her. Jimbop says no and doesn't have love on his mind. In response, the girl says that he'll see differently when he gets to Michigan, and Jimbop responds by saying, Maybe. Good sex will do that to me. Yeah, yeah. I'll treat you like my lover while I'm there. Jimbop adds this by saying, Maybe in four years you'll be my girlfriend. The girl questions why she has to wait so long, and Jimbop corrects himself by saying, Three years. And finally, on August 2nd, 2016, the FBI submitted a criminal complaint to the district court, requesting an arrest warrant for him, and they were granted that on the perfect date. News first broke of Jimbop's actions during early September of 2016, when the YouTuber Scarce reported on it in a video of his, talking about what happened. The court found probable cause to believe that the defendant committed the crimes of receipt of child pornography, production of child pornography, online enticement of a minor, and travel with intent to engage in illicit sexual activity. Drama Alert was quick to follow with their video talking about the situation as well. A YouTuber with over 400,000 subscribers known as Jim Bob has fallen off the face of the earth. He's been missing for about a month. No uploads, no tweets. Well, allegedly, this is because he's been like in jail. He's been in custody and he's been going through court because he produced child poor? Both videos are now unavailable on YouTube today as they've both been deleted by the original creators. The reason for this is unclear, but at best guess, it may have been a request from the authorities to keep the situation on the down low, as not to affect Jim Bob's trial. Another big creator who also made a video on Jim Bob was iMalix, whose video you can still watch today, probably because the authorities can't really go that international. And some information was found that basically said that the bloke is on trial for making child pornography. Incredible. As for Jin's friend Sky, the only thing he tweeted about the case publicly was a simple wow. He later addressed the situation in early 2017 on a live stream, discussing his posturing and contact with Jin Bob. Uh, what happened to Jin Bob? See, I don't fucking know. Me and Jin stopped talking uh, ages ago, um, like about a year and two, three months ago. Real long time ago. Um, I think his last video was uploaded 10 months ago, so. It was like a year before that I stopped talking to him. Um, the only things I know about the entire situation is that he was arrested for some pretty fucked up shit. Uh, this is where I'm about to get controversial. Um, so get ready for this. This could either end my career or prove that I'm very, um, very being very real with you guys. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, I never thought Jin was that bad of a guy when I knew him. That could end my career. See, the thing is, you have to think about things that you're saying, like this type of shit, and whether or not it will like ruin your career, for being honest. Um, I I didn't dislike Jin when I knew him. Um, and uh, it's not my fault or um, has anything to do with me what happened to him, so. 
However, as we've briefly covered before, this may be more than meets the eye, as Tim.TV, a former Sky Media employee, said that his questions about Jim Bob's behaviour were, again, rejected by management, who just told him to carry on working. If they intervened at the time, this whole situation could have been avoided. Another allegation also states that when Jim Bob was arrested in August, Sky knew and instructed everyone not to say anything about it until it became widespread information. Back to Jim Bob, his last public video, One Whale of a Time, is still up today, and has many comments on it before, deriding and mocking the Predator. In a kind of dark, but still kind of funny way, another video that also got a lot of attention following Jim Bob's arrest was an old Q&A video called, I'm getting arrested? Reading mean comments. Finally, a YouTuber who doesn't clickbait. Jin, stop hitting your mic! <laughs> Look, what a man does with his microphone is a very private matter. Leave it between me and my mic, okay? I won't let them hurt you. This is really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but Jin Bob really was hated from every angle. Many of his friends just came out to publicly just shit on him, even if they knew that he didn't have access to the internet. However, contrary to the actions of people like Lion Maker, Jim Bob's channel was never hugely messed with after he went to jail, barring a few anomalies which can be viewed on Social Blade, like this sudden loss of 400,000 views. What happened there? Did a video get striked by YouTube, or did someone delete a video for Jim Bob's channel? And if so, who? We may never know. Arguably the darkest element of the situation though was the treatment of the victim. Following the arrest, many of the fans of Jim Bob actually managed to find the social media of the victim and began harassing her with questions and insults, throwing blame at essentially a 15 year old. Now today this would be unspeakable and unheard of, but back then there were a fair few reasons why this girl was just completely harassed. For one, this was an incredibly politically divided time online. The times of Me Too and Gamergate were fully in their peaks and many people had a different attitude back then. And secondly, it's worth noting that Jim Bob's fans are children, people normally around the the age of 10 to 13, people who only see the world in black and white, people who idolise their favourite creators, and people who can't exactly understand legal documents or the weight of the situation. As depressing as this reaction was, it's worth at least acknowledging that our attitudes towards victims coming out have changed drastically, almost viscerally to the other side of the pendulum where people instead believe all accusations. However, I think everyone agrees that if someone is arrested for preying on a minor with legal documents, then those allegations are probably true. But Jin Bop told a different story to his fellow cellmates. On the 13th of September 2016, Kotaku officially reported that Jin Bop had been arrested. He was sentenced to seven years in prison for his crime and incarcerated at Terminal Island in San Pedro, California. With a release date of the 25th of July 2023, Jim Bop began his long stay. Not a lot is known about Jim Bop's time during jail, mostly because, well, He's in jail, there's not that many verifiable sources. But of the two we have, one is nothing but a rumour and speculation, whilst the other is a comment from someone on YouTube who claims to have been in jail on Terminal Island. But first, the rumour. As this wasn't the victim who came out about the experience, but rather the FBI taking action, the girl herself was pretty annoyed that the police had taken Jim Bopped away. She changed her Twitter bio to, by the way, I still and always will love him, and it's rumoured that Jim Bop and this girl were still sending letters to each other as late as 2018. However, there are a few holes to poke in that theory, such as the fact that none of the details of these letters were ever released. And um, also, how would these letters even get through in the first place? I mean, prison security, FBI monitoring, the United States Postal Service being even more easy to monitor on the internet. I don't know if this is particularly true. The other source of information is from an individual who commented on another video about Jin Bob made by a YouTuber called Cluedo. The person here, who calls himself Tony T, dropped a lot of information about his accounts of Jim Bob as a person during his jail time. That's crazy. I just got released from Federal Correction Institutional Terminal Island, where I, in fact, was in the same unit as Zhao, or Jim Bob as you call him. He definitely told a whole different story, that he wasn't there for crossing state lines with his then girlfriend, who by the way, is still his girlfriend and waiting for him. Said they were dating and her parents were cool with it until her father got mad on him for whatever reason and put the feds on him. That his girlfriend her mother has since moved on away from the father and all due to what he did to him. He did admit to her being underage, but that's why he would just keep it to a certain level. But this is the first I hear about the child porn stuff. If that was brought out into light in the facility, no one would have even fucked with him, talked to him or anything, unless it was the other chomos in there. Shit, now I even feel some type of way for talking to him. I found this video because he used to brag about all the followers he had and whatnot. I would have actually sent word back in there about this, but he was released like two months before me. He should be in a halfway house as we speak. Played a good one. Shit, played everyone in there if this is true. If 
fucking guy. When questioned about how Jinbop was able to get out of jail, Tony had this to say. Got out early because we took this program called RDAP, Residential Drug Awareness Program, but it was more like psychology courses. Of course he passed easy because he's pretty smart, but he would use his fake story all the time to try and get sympathy from other people. Didn't really work though, because anyone there with children would look at him like a piece of shit no matter what he said. Unlike me, I got kicked out of the program for not making up a story and not wanting to talk about family issues. The fuck? Why would I, why would I do that right? That's why it's called family issues, they stay in the family. Well that, and they really didn't like that I would kind of glorify my drug dealing and transport adventures. Lol. But luckily when I got kicked out, Biden's new FSA Act, First Step Act, kicked in for me and they let me go early, or else I would have been in there for another year. FSA wouldn't have worked for Zhao because he was a sex offender. He would have literally gotten even earlier if he had an overdose on K2 slash Spice one night. He literally started pedanting in circles whilst pissing and shitting on himself. Lol. That shit was funny. He got sent to the shoe for two weeks after that, and then had to extend the program another two months. Yep, you heard it right here. Jim Bob overdosed on Spice and danced in circles while pissing and shitting on himself. How fitting. Now again, this could just be some random commenter, but I do actually kind of believe this. This is probably personal opinion, but not only is the lack of profile picture and typing mannerisms a convincing factor, but the information here is so detailed that if someone did make this up, they should get hired as an author. And it also shows the side of Jim Bob that no one really saw either in the legal papers or his videos, that being his ability to manipulate everyone around him and how easy it is to lie. I'm not saying it's not understandable to lie, hell, if I was in that position, admitting to solicitation of CP would be the last thing I would do, but what I'm saying is that the fact he was able to, and he was so skilled at it, is pretty interesting. It's a pretty interesting feat in itself. And as you've seen from Tony T's testimony, on the 2nd of June 2022, Jim Bob was released a year early from prison for good behaviour. Because, well, the American penal system, serving as time and being released from prison. With our findings of the disgusting nature and decrepit desires of a pretty big channel in the Minecraft community, the question remains now. Why does Jinbob still have a channel up, despite being a convicted offender who drew in his victim via his YouTube channel? I mean, it's a very valid question. Numerous channels before have been terminated for actions just like that of Jin, yet his channel still exists today. Listen, when it comes to the subject of free speech, I'd say I'm pretty relaxed about it and like I'm anti-de-platform for most things, but cases like Jinbop are where I draw the line, because now it doesn't matter about what's being said, but who's saying it, and that person can easily upload like nothing ever happened and still have a cult following which he can exploit, proven before by people such as Lion Maker, who got a harrowingly positive reception upon his return. At the end of the day, I don't ask for much, but I think YouTube removing yet another convicted predator of its site is a big priority, especially the one who's been recently released from prison. So until next time, stay toasty.